<laughs> You're a bad person. <laughs> What's up guys, Jack here with MTS, and I figured it was time we had a bit of a chat. So, let's get right into it. Now the first thing I want to talk about is where I've been for the past, well, month and a half. Because for the past month and a half, I've pretty much been offline. And about a month and a half ago, uh, my mother had two strokes. Well, she had one stroke, and then shortly after, she had another stroke. And so that left a lot of swelling and blood clots in her brain. So she recently had brain surgery and I've been spending a lot of time both here taking care of her and at the hospital. It's, it's just been, I didn't really take it too seriously at first because we didn't know it was a stroke. My mom was just all of a sudden really tired and having a lot of the symptoms of allergies, which me and my dad have had for years. So we thought, you know, she was just allergic to something. So she spent, a week living at my grandma's house just to see if it was some sort of allergen in the apartment. And then when me and my girlfriend went to go visit her, the first thing I walk in and see is her clinging onto my dad's arm just to use the restroom. And that was kind of the, oh crap, this is not, this is not a, an allergy issue. But we're in the tail end of it. She's home, she's recovering, she's having a lot of good days, so things are looking up post-surgery MRI shows that everything is gone well so you know we can we can stop stressing about that in the Miller household here now on to the next thing I've been doing a lot of now on to the next thing for the past few months before the whole thing with my mom's stroke happened I was doing a lot of testing with the Omada stuff and I have a lot of the pieces of gear that I was using here now, TP-Link released a new router for the Omada lineup, the ER605, but this is like the ER605 version 2, that, but they don't denote it anywhere. If yours doesn't have a USB port, it's the old one. If you have a USB port, it's the new one. There you go. And in the new one, they added support for USB modems. So if you have like a cellular modem you want to plug into this guy, that'll work. A um, couple of other cool things. I found that you can use this as a VPN client. Now, why would you want to use a router as a VPN client rather than a VPN host? Don't you want your devices to be able to VPN into the network? That's the cool thing. If you use a router as a VPN client, anything I connect to this router will be put behind the VPN connecting back to my house. I wanted this guy to open VPN, connect back to my PFSense router, so that way I could put one of these in my grandma's basement and have an offsite backup server there and stuff. So I'm not having to plug in those open VPN credentials and those profiles into every single device because some devices don't support the ability for me to just plug in a VPN profile to it, such as, I don't know, little smart home gadgets. If I'm running some sort of custom weird oddity thing that I'm just testing, I wanted to be able to just plug in a device and have it be put on my home network while I'm not at home. That was the goal. But you can't do that with these guys. These TP-Link routers, when you're using them in client mode, expect you to be connecting through OpenVPN access server, where you can very easily export a config file that has the credentials for logging in baked into that profile. And that's how this guy authenticates. You can't just type in a username and password to this guy. So using the client export plugin for PFSense, I'm not easily able to export a profile that this guy is able to use. So, and I'm kind of bummed out that I can't really do that with this ER605 because I have two of these guys and really the only use I have for them is, well, doing what I just explained wanting to do. I can put one at my grandma's house, one at my brother's house, and then any device I plug in is connected back to my home network. That would be awesome because I'm not a big fan of the TP-Link routers. Now, I'm also not a fan of any of the Ubiquiti routers or really anything aside from PFSense these days, especially the TP-Link stuff though, because TP-Link devices, especially in the Omada platform, can do some form of layer three routing for the most part. Not all of their devices support this, but the majority of them do. So you have access point routes and you have switch routes. And so you're building out your routing tables multiple times and it's it's just frustrating. So I don't like handling routing on the Omada hardware, so I just choose to do that on anything else. 
And that's really a shame because I don't see much of a use case for these Omato routers. I don't like how they handle routing, so I don't want to use them for anything routing, but that's what a router is for. So even in a home network where I'm setting up, you know, the mainland, the guest network, IOT, uh, possibly security camera networks, I don't want to have to go in and configure all that crap. It's a pain in the butt. I wish TP-Link would offer just a little toggle switch that would say, yeah, just expect every device to be layer two and handle all of the routing, inner VLAN stuff, all that on the router. That'd be great if there's an option for that. But seeing as there's not really the only place I can see this being useful is if you had like an Airbnb where you needed more networking than what a consumer router could provide you, but you don't need anything super crazy. So you set up your main LAN for all of the devices to be on and then you have the guest network, which is just a one click option. And the guest network is what everybody staying at the Airbnb connects to. And the LAN network is just well, the Omada hardware itself. That's pretty much the only actual deployment I could see myself using the ER or Omada routers in. So yeah, that's where I stand with this. Now I stopped using the Omada access points here at my apartment and went back to using my Ubiquiti access points because I kept running into this one weird bug. When I would be on a FaceTime call about two minutes in, my Wi-Fi would drop and it would fail over to LTE or fail over to LTE. Keep in mind, I had the access point sitting right over there and I was trying to make a FaceTime call here in bed. What the heck? So I swapped out the TP-Link access points back for my Ubiquiti ones, a combination of U6 stuff and Wi-Fi 5 stuff and everything was working fine, although it's been doing the same thing now on the Ubiquiti stuff. So I swapped out the Ubiquiti access points back for the TP-Link ones, except for these two, which I, one, have been using this guy for testing. This guy has another use, which I'll get into in just a moment. And I've said before that there's no way the flying saucer dinner plate mega monstrosity 9000 here, but in all seriousness, this is the EAP660 HD, a fantastic Wi-Fi 6 access point. I've said that there's no way this guy will ever pass the wife approval test. And every single woman that I have shown this to has said, yeah, no. So when your access point's that thick and you want me to hang it off your ceiling, that's not going in someone's home. But I challenged TP-Link. I said, make it smaller. They made it smaller. This is the same dimensions as a U6 Lite. Pretty great. This is the EAP610. And let's talk about how it beat Ubiquiti for one of my specific use cases. Now, I take an access point with me when I travel, whether it be for business or for pleasure, I take my own access point because when I'm traveling, whether it's with my family or with my Miller Media team, I don't want us to have to spend the first 15 minutes we're at a place plugging in the Wi-Fi credentials to all of our various devices, whether it be phones, laptops, switches, consoles, whatever. And for the longest time, I was traveling with the Flex HD from Ubiquiti. I would take the Flex HD and a PoE injector with me. But now my Flex HD is in Network in a Box 2.0. Now, technically, I bring the Flex HD with me, but it's part of Network in a Box, which comes with me to an event venue rather than the hotel or place we're staying. So... I needed another solution. Now I started using the APAC Pro as well as a PoE injector, but that was a little bit big and kind of clunky and I, I just didn't want to do that. So I've started using TP-Link's new EAP610 and this thing is pretty awesome. This is the bag that comes with me. It's small, I can just slot it in the backpack and it works great. So we have the Access point itself, this guy is a Wi-Fi 6, 2x2 MIMO um, access point, great access point, gigabit PoE input here. And I've been using one of these FS slim cables for the network connection. And I've done away with the PoE injector in favor of just a little wall wart. This guy's a lot easier to cable and everything. I can just plug this in plug this in, I'm done. Saves space in my backpack, saves time of me setting it up, and this guy has the controller built into it. It's not the Ubiquiti stuff where I have to use it in standalone mode with the phone app. Full web GUI on this guy, I can just go in, change all of my settings, username, passwords, SSIDs, all that stuff, super easy, 
This guy is awesome. TP-Link, thank you for listening. We said make it smaller. You guys made it smaller, and this thing kicks butt. So, I love this guy, great access point, gets my full recommendation. Now let's talk about the failing switch. I did a video talking about the TP-Link big boy as I call it because I'm not gonna remember that long product number. I have since removed the buy links from that video's description because for a while, you shouldn't have bought that switch. Now I mentioned in that video that I had one unit fail on me. I have since had my second unit fail on me and I've had people reach out saying, they've had multiple units fail. People in the comment section, Amazon reviews, this switch is just, it seems to just be a time bomb that about three or four months in, it just dies. Since then, TP-Link has updated the switch chip that it uses. They have used one with tighter quality control that they assure me will fix the problems. Now, TP-Link's gonna be sending me one of those new switches and I'm gonna test it out. If it works, I'll put those purchasing links back in that video description and probably make another video talking about that roller coaster of failures. They've also opened things up for RMA, so if you need to get one of those switches RMA'd and replaced, it will be replaced with a model that should not fail. I have been told, again, I have not yet tested this. Now, I've said the same thing to my TP-Link rep. I don't care about a mistake that a company makes because a company is just a conglomerate of people. I care about how it's recovered from. If you get into a car accident, are you a bad person? No, you're a person that made a mistake. It's about how you recover from it. Do you call the police? Do you hand over your insurance information? Do you do things the right way? Great, you've done all you can do. But if you get into an accident and then you run away and you're in a hit and run, well then you're a terrible person. So <laughs> it's the same thing with a company. TP-Link is taking responsibility. They're saying, hey, yes, we have a faulty product. If you have one of these guys, send it on in and we'll replace it. That's a win in my book. Thank you, TP-Link. Okay, so moving on from the TP-Link section of this video, let's talk about Reolink. Now, Reolink is one of my favorite security camera companies for a number of reasons. One, they make good hardware that just works and doesn't have any weird bugs to it. Well, at least ones that I've found, aside from possibly their iframe interval not being able to be changed. But I love them because of their approach to software and intercompatibility. Yes, they have an app. Yes, they have their own NVRs. Yes, they have their cloud platform. But they also just say, you don't have to use any of it. ONVIF, there you go. Plug into your own system. You wanna bring your own cameras to our system? That's fine. You don't wanna have a system, you just wanna plug an SD card into a camera and have it record? There you go, you can do it. They give you so many options. They have the tools available, so if you want the cloud connection, you can do that. If you want to use their NVR, you can do that. If you want to use their app, you can do that. I can tell you right now, I have not touched their NVRs or their apps because I haven't needed to. So thank you, Reolink. You make a product and I feel like I own it. I feel like once I have purchased this product, I have not bought into your ecosystem. I have bought a product, the product that does what it claims to do on the box, the way it claims to do it on the box, and it just works. Reolink seems to be the only player in the game that understands this, and I respect and appreciate that so much. Now they recently sent me out, well, not recently, this was a couple months ago, they sent me out their Duo camera. And this guy is pretty cool, it's upside down. <laughs> this guy's actually a pretty cool camera. We have two five megapixel lenses on this guy. And not just lenses, cameras. This guy is two security cameras built into one, which is awesome. You set this up in the center of a building, you have full coverage and it's like angled there. It's, this thing is awesome and they were able to handle the stitch line actually really well. Although it doesn't actually stitch the images together, this still appears to any NVR as two separate cameras, but just within one form factor. But this guy is awesome, and since sending me this, I've gone ahead and ordered like 10 of them for a new deployment that I'm doing for a client. I love this camera, this guy's great. I'm gonna have a full video coming out on this very soon. The video is on my server, but the line going down to the basement is dead, so I gotta replace that line. I don't wanna replace that line. But I need my server, garage access point, and camera down there to all be up, so that's what I'm gonna do after I'm done filming this video, is go fix that line. And last but not least, I'm gonna be doing a full series of creating a budget home lab here on the channel. It's gonna include things like building out our router, sourcing a cheap switch, that's also a good switch, where to get connectors and all that stuff, building an NVR slash application server, a storage server, and how to set all of this stuff up. And we're gonna be doing it on a ridiculously small 
budget and talking about how you can find gear that is multi-purpose. So you're not buying this piece of gear just for this job because it's a home lab. Its job should change as you're growing and learning new things. You want to have a gear that can adapt with you as you grow and move on in your learning process. So expect a full series of videos coming out on that. But anyway, guys, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and drop a like. If you really liked it and want to see more of me in your subscription feed, well, then you can go ahead and get subscribed. You can go down to the description to take a look at all the... Dude, I'm forgetting how to talk to... It's been too long since I've talked to a camera. Bye.